Hey there, everybody. How we doing? It's Mr. White here. So we are moving into the final component of our rhetoric unit before we move on to our next thing. So we've been thinking about techniques. We've been talking about techniques. We've been discussing our opinions about techniques. Now it's time that we put everything together in one coherent package. So today we are going to begin discussing rhetorical analysis and how we build claims for that. So first and foremost, what is a rhetorical analysis? Well, it's very similar to something that you guys already have a lot of experience with, which would be literary analysis. So essentially, you are looking at a piece of writing that is persuasive in nature, and you are forming some opinions about it that you can support with evidence. So a rhetorical analysis should explore the writer or speaker's goals, what they want the audience to do or think, the techniques or tools used, like, for example, diction and connotation, or figurative language, or logos or ethos. You should have some examples of those techniques, and then you should be able to talk about whether they are effective or not for the intended audience. So if the writer is using juxtaposition, is the juxtaposition that they're utilizing going to work on their audience? Is it going to persuade them to do or think what the writer wants them to do or think? So something that you have to remember about writing a rhetorical analysis, however, is that you are not saying whether you agree with the writer's argument or not. It does not matter if you agree in a rhetorical analysis. The only thing that matters is that you're discussing how the rhetorician, the writer, makes their arguments and whether or not they are successful. In fact, during class, we had many people talk about how they liked Here I Stand more, but they thought the perils of indifference was more effective. That's good. That means you guys are already thinking objectively about rhetoric. We really have to emphasize that. It does not matter if you agree with the ideas or not. You're simply looking at their rhetorical techniques, their ability to persuade or not persuade their audience. So how can you approach a rhetorical analysis? What ways can you jump in there? Well, we will be looking at some examples over the next couple of days of rhetorical analysis and also building our own before our big final writing piece but these are some questions that you can answer over the course of your analysis. So first, you're going to need to know what is the writer's goal? What do they want people to do? That's a really, really fundamental part of rhetorical analysis. And you can think about things like what persuasive appeals are used and why? Ethos, pathos, logos. Will those be effective for the writer's audience? Okay, if the writer is talking to a bunch of scientists, Okay, is their use of pathos going to be effective or ineffective? If the writer is talking to a bunch of middle school kids, is their use of ethos going to help get those middle school kids to do what they want? We can also think about specific techniques, how they're used and how they guide the reader's understanding. For example, purposeful structure emphasizing ideas, repetition highlighting specific concepts, or juxtaposition creating contrast to show us differences. We want to think, okay, do the techniques used support any of the intended appeals? If they're using figurative language, does it add to the pathos? If they're using repetition, does it enhance the ethos? How does the writer create tone and mood through connotation? So tone is really crucial when we're thinking about persuasion. Okay, We have to think, how is that tone or mood going to affect the reader? Are they going to come on too strong and sound too angry and turn off their audience if that audience doesn't like that kind of thing? Or is it actually going to fire up their audience? You want to think, okay, do the writer's arguments make sense? Are they logically sound? Or do they kind of like not make any sense at all? And then finally, is the writer's diction, tone, mood, or technique use in general appropriate for their audience? Are they speaking to their audience in the appropriate way that will allow that audience to feel what they need to feel in order to be persuaded? All right, a big part of this, just like in literary analysis, is going to be creating claims. So this is the first thing that we're starting with today. 
Rhetorical analysis is driven by a claim. That means an arguable original point. Okay, it's something that someone could disagree with you about, but that you can support with evidence from the text. Now, I'm going to show you two different types of claims for rhetorical analysis. We have to be aware that some of these claims can be very, very specific in terms of what they deal with, and others can be more general. However, you should always touch on the writer's goal in your claim. Let's take a look at some examples. So here is an example of a specific claim. Now, when should we use a specific claim? Well, if a writer is utilizing one technique a lot, okay? So for example, if they're using tons and tons and tons of pathos, you should be focusing on pathos. If they use boatloads of repetition, you should be focusing on repetition. If there's like an insane amount of juxtaposition in there or syntactical choices, you should be focusing on those. You should only do this when you can find multiple examples of whatever t technique you're discussing, though. So our example here. In his retirement speech, Lou Gehrig effectively utilizes an Afra to persuade his audience of American baseball fans that he is satisfied with his career and appreciative of their support. So if we break this down, we can see that in the red, I say effectively. So I'm making a judgment, okay? I'm saying, I think he was successful in persuading these people. Then if you look at my highlight, I talk about a specific technique. Now I focused on one type of purposeful repetition, an Afra. But you can go ahead and utilize just purposeful repetition or a broader term if that makes more sense for you. Next, I touched on his audience, not necessary, but it really makes writing this thing easier if you spell it out in your claim. And then finally, in the underlined portion there, this is the purpose, the goal that Lou Gehrig had in his speech to persuade people that he was appreciative of their support and that he was satisfied with the end of his career. So again, red, I'm talking about whether it worked or didn't. Highlighted, I'm talking about the specific technique. Bold, I discussed the audience, and then underlined, I talked about the goal or purpose. Now, we also have broader claims. These are useful when a piece uses a wide, wide range of techniques or appeals or doesn't really focus on one for too long. So these should be used when you need to utilize several different types of evidence. For example, maybe you want to talk about figurative language and juxtaposition or you want to talk about pathos and purposeful repetition and how those connect to each other. Okay, that can be done as long as you're making sure to keep your claim relatively general. So our example here, though brief, Lou Gehrig's retirement speech is successful at persuading his many supporters and fans that they should not despair at the end of something, but rather celebrate meaningful relationships that were built along the way to that ending. So you'll notice I have my highlighted section talking about whether this was successful or not. I have my bolded section addressing his audience. And I have my underlined section talking about his uh, purpose or goal. What is not included in this one is the specific technique I will be examining. Because in this piece, I would probably be talking about several different techniques as opposed to just one. This way I don't get boxed in and my analysis actually matches up with my claim. All right, now what we're going to have you do is review your analysis of King's I Have a Dream speech. So both your document and your questions that you've been preparing, you're going to utilize this knowledge to generate four different claims. They should be very, very different about the piece. Two of them should be very specific. They should be touching on specific techniques or appeals that he utilizes. And two of them should be much more general and broad so that you could talk about several different types of technique in your analysis. All the claims should look and sound significantly different. So you should try rearranging the syntax. You know, that's the sentence structure if necessary. But these claims should not all look the exact same. They should not have the same sentence structure. You should be varying them. Okay, guys, 
Make sure you reach out if you have any questions. Have a great day. We'll see you later.